Thank you. I must confess, I do not have any slides to share for you today. Uh, actually, when I was asked to do this presentation, I was told it's preferred no slides because I was presenting later on. Uh, actually, that order got switched, so I presented earlier, so now I'm coming later on to talk about this. Um, in particular, I'll be talking about partnerships in educating, and I'm just going to put it that way. Um, we all know to educate, we have to reach the kid first, and in the past, uh, or in a very recent past, we always felt as educators that it was on us, sometimes because it was on us. Uh, the scores come down on us, and we made it about us. Actually, we were encouraged to make it about us. And honestly, that was the worst mistake we ever made, is made it about us. Because it is not about us, it's about the kids. It's about the families, and it's about the community. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we have a lot of communities that need a lot of help. And if we make it about us, we will see what we saw in the last decade. A bunch of teachers leaving the profession. And, a hard, and, and educators and administrators that are hard-pressed to find educators willing to step in. You go to any college preparatory program for teachers, and they're down. They're down drastically. It's scary. It's time that we take that weight off of us. And I'm going to first say there was a time in my life where I despised IDOE because I thought they were putting it on our shoulders, and it really isn't. It's, it's a lot of other people higher up, and I'm not going to get into that. We have to take that off of our shoulders, and we have to find partners. I think we've been pitted against each other in terms of finding those resources and um, kept them secret. And I don't believe in secrets. I believe in sharing because it's all about the kids. So my focus in this presentation, I'm going to make it quick. I always say that, but they always tell me I talk too long. By the way, Uncle Dustin, is he still here? I can't call him Uncle Dustin. People would probably laugh and call me Uncle or Grandpa Wilson, so it's probably more appropriate. That guy rocked. I will tell you, he motivated me. Um, also made me think that I was a terrible teacher for a little while there, so <laughs> <clears throat> I'll just put it out there. But going back to the process of finding, uh, finding resources for your community, um, I guess I've been blessed, and I, I, I will confess that my wife has a big part of it. She's a social worker, and I used to always tell her, well, I'm doing this. I, I try to find this, and we got this going on with this family. And she's like, hey, they got a program for that. And it got to the point where I wanted to go find the easy button and just pin it on her head, but she wouldn't appreciate that either, I'm sure. In developing those community partners and in my program, and actually you can get a hold of the slides. They're on, on, my, on the site. Um, I really focused on finding supporters in mental health and, and finding those uh, partners that wouldn't cost the school an arm and a leg, and we could get to parents and we could get to students. Um, I'm gonna name a few people and places. I'm gonna name a few programs. Some of them, I will tell you, are available to everybody across the state. Uh, we partnered with metal agencies such as Porter Stark Services, and I know there's representatives here from there. Um, they provide uh, they provide uh, counseling, therapy. They provide in the schools, they provide case management, uh, teaching kids who are struggling, um, social skills, um, how to deal with and express their needs appropriately to adults. So how does it work? We have an MOU, we have a memorandum of understanding between us and, and that, that company. They come in during non-academic hours and they pull those kids weekly and run groups and run um, activities that help build those social skills, help strengthen that kid's confidence so that young man or young woman is able to come to a teacher and express their needs. That is powerful in terms of what then we can do as teachers, as educators, because the other big proponent of or component of that process and that partnership is Porter Stark actually helps educate our educators as well. The First Aid Mental Health, they're help sponsoring a training for all of our educators. We have 11 schools, so we have a pretty big 
uh, uh, conglomerate of teachers and educators and uh, aides and bus drivers. We try to get them all into this because it's important that we take care of ourselves and that we understand that process so that we could take care of those kids. Uh, we have Crown, Crown Counseling, another partner that we have, and, and you guys are saying, well, that's not around me. I'm going to tell you, they are around you. You just have to look for those providers, and they are in my slides. There's county by county providers of mental health that you may be able to partner with in terms of getting services to kids based on sliding scales, based on Medicaid. That part actually goes on between the parent and them. Now I'm going to revert back to sort of a level, what I call level one, because I try to offer it to everybody and I try to offer it to everybody first. Community Partners Grant. Anybody ever hear of that? Couple people. It's across the state available to you. It is a grant given by the Department of Family and Children or CPS or DCS, I always get that mixed up. But that's who offers that grant. And they provide it to every region in the state. Somebody is in charge of that grant. And that grant is meant to prevent child abuse, preventative me measures, which then includes wraparound services for that child and that family in need. And guess what? It's no cost to the school. It's no cost to the parents. Six to ten weeks, a grant manages that through Department of Family and Children. They have a provider that provides that service in each region. Now, if you go to the slides show that I left on that, on the Whole Child Summit site, underneath my presentation, you'll be able to see that map. Click on it. There's the uh, uh, web address to that. You'll be able to get right to it and see who your provider is. Reach out to those individuals and try to find some support for your families. Again, free services in your county, by region, in your county, even if they you're in a rural area, they do travel. I've seen them do it. In our area, I know, and according to the grant, they will travel. You talk about tutoring. You talk about um, family services. I had a family whose father lost their job. They weren't coming to school because the car broke down. They couldn't pay. They walked in with job-seeking services for that, wrote, a, wrote a, uh, a resume for the family, for the father, helped them find a job, get, got them into some job coaching, um, helped repair the car, helped get that kid back into school where they needed to be, and then provided family counseling as a wraparound services. And because the kid missed quite a bit of school, there was tutoring that was available to them as well. So there are these grants out there. There are services out there. Now, I think the biggest piece was uh, that I was asked about is how did you get these services? How did you get mental health agencies into your building. I'll be quite honest with you. Um, I was in a district where we had a huge, an urban district where we had a huge need. I actually had several students lose their lives. I had a parent actually shoot a mother in front of the kids and it came out of tragedy. And it also, you know, it, it just was a need. And just reaching out to people and finding best source called the local hospital, the social work department, has to, hey, what do you have in this line for this situation? I explained who I was, and they threw out three or four names. Community Partners was one of them. I reached out to them. They were able to explain what they do and how they do it, and they were anxious to come and start helping. Um, those resources are not, they're out there. And so that is really the main focus of how do we go about doing it, and what does it look like? And, and for instance, once we got that going, and well, six to ten weeks, they had these services in place. What happens after six and t to ten weeks? Two, uh, twofold. Community Partners gives our staff training on how to manage kids who have these adverse needs. We all talk about traumatic events in our life, but they also have those needs. So how do we address those? How do we reach kids, and, and what do we do? Training is a big component of what was provided to our staff on top of the services that were given to the kids. What's nice about that is that our agreement with the families is, hey, even in situations uh, with the families is, we don't know the details of the therapy. We just know that they're in therapy and that th things are progressing as they should and that we are able to move on and we have a plan 
to, to address this young person in need, as well as to get the family on board. Because we provided services not just to that kid, but to the whole family, and we showed that it wasn't, I think I heard it earlier, it wasn't a punitive measure. We weren't out to get your kid. We're out to help you support yourself and your child, and this is one of the resources we have. We were able to find a lot of success. Um, partnership with your local, believe it or not, your local city or, or government agency, police departments. Uh, we, in our area, had a huge issue with truancies and attendance. We have a countywide attendance ordinance that is now enforced. We have a, a county court judge who's, if need be, because we go through 15 steps before they make it to court. One of them is referral to community partners. And once, if they do make it to the truancy court, which some do, it's about peeling back that onion, finding the good layer, and finding out what happened to the top layers, and, and, and then putting services in place. The difference between after the judge, or being in court, or before court, the judge is going to order community partners program as well. The difference is, I recommended it, tried to avoid that. Now the judge is saying, it's ordered. You have to partake. And so, is it a, I will tell you, it's the hardest thing to do is to issue the citation to the parents for attendance and then try to get them on board with you. But once you get them in the court, because they're ordered to be in court, we're able to bring our social workers in and, and calm them down and say, hey, look, we tried several ways to get you in to help remedy the situation. We're here again to do the same thing. We want your son or daughter in our school. We want you to be part of our school. And this is the stuff that we can offer you to get you in here, to, to fix this problem that's that's causing this issue. Some of it's childcare. Kids stay home, older kids stay home to take care of younger kids that aren't in school yet. School. Um, we've actually developed, talk about tier three. Gemnus Corporation also runs um, Head Start program. Well, to qualify for the Head Start program, they have to be socioeconomically um, disadvantaged. Well, we're offering up space in a couple of our schools so they can install their Head Start program into, into our schools countywide. We service the whole county. But out of the three classrooms we're offering, one's going to be guaranteed all ported res students that qualify. Now, the things that trump those, those uh, qualifications, if a kid has special needs or if a kid is um, a CHINS uh, case, child in need of services, probably in foster care or something like that, child services is involved, then they automatically can be placed into those programs. Why did we do that? Because we have families that need to work. They talk about working. They have younger kids and keep older kids home because they need child care to be able to work, um, to pay the rent, to pay the bills. They can't get the younger kid into a, a preschool because they can't afford it. So we're, and selfish reason, how many of you have kindergartners beginning of the year? How many of you can relate to how the transition is from home to kindergarten for the first month of school? It's tough. It is tough. Those kindergarten teachers have the hardest job I've seen because they get kicked, bit, scratched, yelled at, spit on. I worked at the prisons, and I didn't get it as often as they did. And I'm dead serious. So for us to find those services that are in place, that are ready to be delivered, is is. It's not an easy task. You have to flip a lot of rocks, but it's a doable task. And I'm going to tell you the first point of attack that I would recommend to all of you is to look to find out who is managing your community's partners grant. Again, the map is there, but you can also contact a local DCS office because it's their grant, and they hired somebody to, to uh, manage that grant. Now, what would eliminate, if a kid is already in a CHINS kid, they won't be able to be referred to community partners. They're already getting services through Child Protective Services. So they are in services, um, and, and so that would be met at that point. Um, and the other part is your local police department. Uh, creating a good relationship with them, 
it's amazing that our SROs, they'll call us in the middle of summer or they'll let us know on a, on a Saturday night if they got a call to a certain house and what the issue was so that we can prepare for counseling or for interventions on that Monday when we're coming back or that Tuesday. And unfortunately, we had a situation where we had a, a young man take his own life, and we knew about it well before we came back to school and we were able to prepare and get... We had 14 agencies in our building, in our high school, counselors, therapists, licensed therapists and case managers in our building that Monday that we returned, ready to, to handle a need. Because we had teachers and we had students who were highly distraught and in need. And I'm gonna be, be honest with you, there is no way we could have handled that volume, uh, that volume on that day. There would have been a lot of kids that went unserved and that went home, and who knows what could have happened at that point. We all know how, unfortunately, suicide works. There's a lot of followers in some, in some of those instances. And so if we don't reach out and touch that child on that day, there's a likelihood that something bad could continue to happen. And so, <clears throat> you know, when I was asked to talk about this, I didn't really, really uh, think it was a big deal, the things that we had in place at Portage, things that we had in place at Hammond. It just was something that was a necessity. And that's what I'm going to ask you guys to do is think about three big rocks, three big problems in your community. And if you're educating a whole child, you can't be afraid of any issue. That's what I'm going to tell you right now. You can't be afraid of uh, mental health issues. You can't be afraid of substance abuse issues. Those used to be faux pas back in the day. Nobody wanted to touch them. Everybody was scared. You can't. Because that kid, if he's at home with somebody who's addicted, or if that kid's addicted himself, who's going to get him out? Mr. Uh, Uncle Dustin is somebody a kid can relate to. And somebody a kid in high school, if gets wrapped up in that stuff, is going to remember Uncle Dustin and go back to him and say, I need help. Because that kid may not have somebody at home. It's amazing how this world has changed in terms of, I remember growing up, I could do something down the street and I was in trouble before I even got home because I was in trouble before I got home. The neighbor took care of it too. But I knew the neighbor already talked to my mom and it was going to be worse. So uh, that doesn't happen today. Everybody's afraid of, of addressing another child. And, and, and I see why, because I've seen... I've seen those instances as a principal, as, as now a central office, I've seen the instances where you talk to or intervene on, on a kid doing wrong, and sometimes the parents react totally wrong. And I'm just going to say it that way. There's no other way to put it. The key is that you also reach out to those parents, too, and we, we help. And trust me, I've been called all kinds of names. Um, but 99% of the time, when, the, when they said their piece, usually they listen and I, I'm able to get them to accept some sort of help and some sort of assistance. And I'd let them know, it's no big deal. Everybody needs help at some point. I didn't get here on my own. I got here with a lot of hands and a lot of patience. You know, if I could give the referral, my mom was here on this earth, she would tell you it was a lot of patience. I'm sure it was. So I'm going to wrap it up with that. I just wanted to share with you the importance of the level two, level three, uh, M if you consider MTSS the model, level one and two, or level two and three, sorry, supports. Now, I focused on the mental health side because I was asked to. But remember, there's multiple sides to a whole child, and you have to have those supports in place for all those facets on a child. Be it physical, be it emotional, um, be it the academic side, you have to have some of those supports. You know, I hear people run, you know, talk about MTSS and RTI and PBIS. Those are all things that fit underneath that operation or that umbrella of MTSS. The question is, where does it fit? Does it fit under the academic side? Does it fit under the social interpersonal side? Does it fit in the emotional side? Does it fit in the physical side? That's the big question. And so what I would encourage you guys to do is start off just by looking at that community partners grant. Another partner we have, I forgot to mention, and, and, and it is statewide, is Meridian Health. They're in 700 and something schools in Indiana, they, I was told. 
We partnered with them just lately, recently. Um, they're a full-scale medical facility, medical partner. We just partnered with them for behavior sciences and therapy because we do have, uh, we also have, uh, we created a health a consortium, North Shore Health. One of our school nurses decades ago thought it was important for students to have access to health care, wrote a grant, and it grew into, now they have nine full-scale medical facilities. One was housed in our, in our high school for the longest. Just this year, our student center is still there. Our faculty center is still there. The community center was moved to a brand new, beautiful building across the street that they built for a lot of money. But it's beautiful, and they serve us. So you, when you create these partners, the one thing I told all of everybody, and I have six mental health agencies working in our, our facilities now, is they come together at the table periodically throughout the year. And when I first brought them on as partners, part of the MOU is the sandbox is big enough for everybody. And you may be good at this, you may be good at that, you may be great with uh, substance abuse counseling, you may be good with uh, younger kids, therapy for you know, uh, preschool kids. I need your expertise, I need you to be honest, and I need us to share our resources, and I need us to affect these kids in a positive way. Having those open, honest communications with those individual partners, and they're out there, you may have to dig under rocks. Again, start with the Community Partners Grant. St look at that, there is a map on there, or contact DCS office and say, hey, who is your provider for the Community Partners Grant? When I first got to Portage, I asked about that, and they're like, we never heard of that grant. I found out I was housed in LaPorte. They drove from LaPorte to Portage, which is a pretty decent drive, if you know the area, to service our kids and to create that partnership. So I'm going to end there because I'm sure I went over my time, and I'm going to leave time for any questions that you may have. I have, I have one. Is this on? Okay. It's on. I have one. I, I really appreciate what you just said about um, share, basically sharing, right? You're in a mm -hmm. school district where you have multiple community mental health agencies. Um, you know, uh, there can be some territory uh, stuff going on or, you know, no, that's my school or that's my school district. So I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the fact that the expectation that you have as a school district is that everybody plays well together in the sandbox because we got to be models for kids. We, well, yeah, that's yeah. a great, that's a great, um, that's a great comment. I, so I just, I don't really have a question necessarily more so is just a comment. I think that's really important as I travel around the state. Um, you know, I get that a lot. It's like, Oh, well we have this, uh, community mental health center, um, an MOU with them in our district. So we couldn't possibly engage with another one. And I'm like, well, certainly you could, especially if you have a need. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just appreciate, I appreciate you talking to us about that. It goes back to, it does take a village and there's not one person that has all the answers. Um, I will, I value our partnerships. In fact, something I didn't mention, I know somebody's here from Doolin schools. We go as far as sharing. Uh, we sent an MOU with several of our, our Porter County schools have agreed that, hey, if there's a huge crisis at our school, we'll send our resources to your school as well. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, it's all hands on deck. It's about the kids. It's not about a corporation. It's not about a, one community versus another community. It's about you know, getting those kids to understand, yes, you live in a small community, but you're part of a big picture. And the health of that big picture depends on you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Right I either bored you to death, answered anything I, <laughs> that you had. None? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.